All right, complexity of meaning. And this one's a lot of people struggle with these lectures, but I'm just trying to summarize it. I hope I do a good job. Huh? Okay, let's uh, look at <clears throat> a passage of scripture has one meaning but many applications. A lot of people say that that's a myth. That's wrong. A passage of scripture has next slide <clears throat> one meaning, many partial summaries, many more applications. All right. Just remember this slide, it will help you a lot. Okay. I'm trying to put the slide so it'll help you to grasp what all the talking was in third mill. All right, next. First, you must know the literal sense. Okay. In other words, the original author was writing a real letter. There was a meaning to his letter, generally speaking. Could be poetic, could be narrative, but he meant something, all right? That's called the literal sense. The original author, Ezra, was writing something to someone literally, all right? Okay. He had a he had a purpose in writing it. He wasn't just throwing words together. All right, next. So that's called the literal sense. Though there's one literal sense, there may be many partial summaries. Let's see what a summary is. Okay, next slide. A summary is a description of a passage from a different vantage point. The guy here in the picture, looking on the ocean, he's seeing the same scene, but he's seeing the ocean. If he went down to the cliff, off the cliff, he went right down to the bottom, he will be seeing the same scene, but he will see more seashore, some rocks, and less of the sea. But if he also was turning around, he would see a lot of grass. Well, my point is, it's the same scene, but it depends on where you're standing. You see different things. All right, so let's look at the next slide. So what is a summary? It's a vantage point. So Genesis chapter one, obviously, is about the creation, how God created the world. So that's a literal sense. Now, if you're an organized mind, what will you be preaching from Genesis chapter one? You'll be preaching about how orderly God is. Wow, first three days, he make the stage. Next three days, he put the actors on the stage. Wow, okay. You artistic guy, you're probably saying, wow, God is amazing. Huh? He made the birds. Wow, so many kinds of birds. How can I? Just two wings, one big, and there's so many different kinds. Huh? Wow, wow, how does God think huh, of so many colors, so many different shapes of big He's a must be artistic God. So it's still God created birds, but as an artistic mind, you're impressed by the wow, the variations. If you're a mathematician, you'll probably say, Wow, God is a mathematician, you know. He said, uh, two produce two, the, then the four produce eight, and the eight produce 16. Oh, very fast, huh? You can fill the world, huh? Well, God is a mathematician, man. So you, if you're a mathematician, you'll see God's creation from a different angle as an artist. <clears throat> All right. If you're a doctor or a person who studies genetics, you say, wow, God understand DNA. Ah. Just transfer the DNA, the DNA, DNA now. And then everything the same. Ah. One, the dog produce dog, cat produce cat. Wow. Amazing. Ah. God understands biogenetics. Ah. <clears throat> it depends on your angle that you come in. <clears throat> okay. So if you are a HR guy, you say, wow, ah. God very smart. Ah. It gives six days of work, one day of rest. Huh? Yeah, men need rest, man. I tell you, uh, if you don't have rest, uh, your production drop. No? <clears throat> you see, so it's the same story <clears throat> of creation, but it depends on your angle, how you see things. It's like you're going to play, you know? When you see a play, the artistic guy will say, wow, the backdrop so beautiful. Huh? The guy who likes music, oh, no, the, the music is very good, no, this play. He never saw the backdrop, no. <clears throat> Another guy will say, Hey, I tell you all the actors are top class. Man. And now I say, wow, the script, uh, amazing, man, the storyline. You see, it's the same play, but everybody see from a different angle. That's the word summary. So in one simple chapter on Genesis, you can preach so many important things, beautiful things, true things, not out of context. It's all about creation. But God created orderly, God created artistic things, God created you know, things that could multiply very fast. God created things that will continue to duplicate themselves, clone themselves because of DNA, blah, blah, blah. All right? Okay, next. 
So this, how many different summaries will depend on how complex the passage is, how many unique interpreters come in on the scene, mathematician comes in, he brings out a new point. Atomic scientist comes in and says, wow, when God created the world, it's an like explosion, like an atomic explosion. All the stars fill the whole universe. Wow, that is like an atomic explosion. So depends on how unique the interpreter is. You see something else. Okay. Then, of course, it, you preach according to the audience. Are the mathematicians? You say, you know, you know. You thought you guys thought you know, learn geometric progression. The Arabs learn it. God knew that long ago. No? You thought you learn about DNA now. Ah? Big deal, lah. 1960, you learn about DNA. God knew DNA long ago already. <clears throat> All right. So you can depends on how many unique interpreters, how complex the passage, and who you want to preach to. You can preach. Next, next slide. So basically, the Bible is literally inexhaustible as a preaching material. That's why people have been preaching from the Bible for thousands of years, still got new interesting things to preach on, right? Because you see from a different angle. So the Bible is one meaning. Every passage has one meaning. Genesis 1 was the meaning. Creation of the world, that's a meaning. Any other meaning? No, creation of the world. Summaries, plenty. All right? Applications even more, lah, right? Okay, so we can depends on the audience. We can use it to apply in 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 different ways. Okay, all right. So so it's like a gemstone, lah. You know, I remember my my wife inherited a grandmother's diamond. So few cuts. You go to the pawn shop, also they don't want. They say, hey, this one, ah, only like sixteen faces, no good, lah. Now it's you know seventy two or whatever. You know, you cut more faces in the same stupid diamond, you get more and more beautiful light coming out. All right. So it's the same passage of scripture. If you're a good interpreter, you can see so many things to preach from. All right. Instead of preaching boring three point sermons, uh, gospel sermon every week, you know. <clears throat> all right. So different preachers can find, okay, this one is just next, next slide, please. <clears throat> But every partial summary must be tied to the literal sense. Like basically, Genesis 1 is about creation. I don't go and talk about something else. Like, right? You just say God is an amazing creator, artistic creator, orderly creator, mathematical creator. But he's a, basically, you have to, it's a literal sense. Is Genesis 1 is about creation. Don't go and twist it around to something else. Okay. So the literal sense is creation, but there's so many summaries of that creation. Yeah. Next. Okay, the quadriga, huh? this is the one that we talk about. Okay, the quadriga is a four horse chariot, a Roman chariot pulled by four horses. All right, now there is a, it is a method of interpretation, some dangers, I'll talk about it later, but it helps you to do interpretation. And I use the example before the children of Israel left Egypt. Okay. What's the literal one? The Sunday school story, la, literal. Children of Israel, God parted the sea, they left Egypt. That's the literal one. Typological? Oh, the type is, we were all helpless in sin, just as the Israelites were helpless in slavery to the Egyptians. But one day, God visited them. They didn't ask for God. God visited them in his grace. And God told them, paint blood on the doorpost. So what's the type? One day, God opened our eyes. We were helpless in sin. And we trusted the blood of Jesus to save us. What is the type? Okay. So the literal now, we got a type. Tropological, moral. Moral is, <clears throat> a, when you are in a place of idolatry like the Egyptian, the, the Israelites among the Egyptians, we should do our best to flee. God opens the door to flee. Flee away from temptation. <clears throat> That's tropological. Moral. Same story, but you're using a moral angle. Anagogical. <clears throat> 
wow, they were freed from slavery, from all the horrible life they had. One day, rapture will come and we will be free. Eschatology. You can use it eschatologically. So basically, the same story, you can use different, different angles. So this is the quadriga method, literal, typological, tropological, and agogical. All right. So a wise preacher knows how to get a lot by using a method like this. But there's some danger in this method, which the lecturers told us. Let's look at it. Okay. <clears throat> Next slide, please. <clears throat> Quadrigo is used extensively, or rather abused by the Roman Catholic Church to produce unbiblical doctrines that support their church beliefs or traditions. You know, when you play with typological and all that, you can extend it to some crazy thing to prove a point, all right? Let's just say, I'm not saying the Roman Catholic Church did this, let's just say, they want to prove that when you go and take the mass, you know, the, the, the cup is the blood of Jesus, you know, uh, uh, literal blood of Jesus, then maybe they could use it, you know, the lamb, uh, lamb's blood, it's not really blood of Jesus, right? The lamb's blood, huh? actually, yeah, uh, it's like Jesus' blood. Just like this wine we drink. Uh, it's actually not really blood. Uh, just like lamb's blood, it's not really the blood of Jesus. Uh, but this lamb's blood uh, can become the blood of Jesus when you drink it. Oh. So they could use it to extend and prove their points. You know? So there's a danger in typological that we sometimes can stretch it to prove something we want to prove. Also, just be careful when you preach and use this quadriga method, there is a danger. Though I won't say that if you use it carefully, it's useful. I use it all the time. Is that typological? Is that tropological? And then when you preach, it's richer, it's nicer, all right? And it's also hopefully accurate. Yeah, next. So in the quadriga method, what's wrong is the four horses are equal. That's never true. Never true. One horse is always the lead horse, the literal sense. Always remember, if you want to use the quadriga method, it's not four equal horses. It's one lead horse. The literal sense must always be remembered. And your type cannot stray too far from the literal sense. Right? If you understand this, it's a quadriga, but not exactly four horses running together. Not four literal, typological, tropological, anagogical, equal. No, literals are number one. Then you start doing the rest, you won't probably go too far wrong. I hope I'm not confusing you guys. Huh? Okay, I'm just revising, so I hope I'm not telling you new stuff, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Next. All right, so that's basically it. Huh? Literal sense is the most important last line there. Okay, next. So in the Bible too, all right, we have what we call elaborations and deepening. Okay, let's just take sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder. Okay. If you go down later to numbers, it explains what murder is. Murder is not just killing somebody. Murder is killing someone with intention to kill. So in numbers it says, if the guy was chopping you know, something or, and the axe just happened to fly and kill somebody, that's not murder. That's manslaughter. He doesn't have to die for that. All right? So sometimes one command of the Bible is elaborated a bit further. And Jesus brings it even deeper. He said, you know what's murder? You look at your brother with hatred in your eyes and basically said, you idiot, you fool, go to hell. That is murder. Wow. You mean that's murder? Oh. Who interpreted the Bible that way? Jesus. Oh, must be correct, right? So, sixth commandment is not about you know, you ask average Christian, are you a murderer? No, Allah. joking are you? I never murder anyone, what? And then yet they read, Jesus saying that if you hate your brother, 
that is murder. You see, they thought Exodus 20 is thou shalt not kill means I didn't take a knife and kill someone. You ask anyone in your church tomorrow, are you a murderer? 99 out of 100 will say, Pastor, stop joking, lah, Pastor. <laughs> I'm not murderer, lah. Okay, and yet they read the elaboration, the deepening, the heart sin that Jesus described as murder. All right. So when you interpret the Bible, you must understand. You sometimes have to see one verse, and it is elaborated. Manslaughter is not murder, and it's deepened. Hatred in your heart against someone you wish you could kill him, you wish you would die. That's also murder. And then we have extensions as a preacher. Is abortion murder? Christians are still debating. Euthanasia. Old people suffering a lot of pain and all that. Should you just spare him? Give him a nice injection and say goodbye to him? Be kind to him? Many European countries now. Euthanasia is promoted, right? Stretch it further. You saw your neighbor hungry, and you know he's on his last meal, and you had the means to help, you didn't help him. Is that murder? <laughs> okay, so when you want to preach, you have a mind that understands the Bible is richer and deeper than the Sunday school version of the literal sense. I hope you, you, as preachers, we must understand the book is deep, is rich. And you want to preach well, you must understand there's different ways of preaching, not just shallow like Sunday school, you know. That's why a lot of preaching is so simple and so boring. I'm not saying simple is bad, but it's boring. There's nothing. They have, th they have nothing to preach. The average pastor borrows a sermon because he reads the Bible, there's nothing in it for him to preach. Mm. Right? I'm not saying borrowing sermons wrong, but it's so sad when the Bible is so much. Mm. Right? Okay, next. Mm. So this foundations of Bible is, is just to help us to understand, you know, that our job is to know the Bible. That's our job. That's our tool. If, if you are a soldier, you don't use the rifle, something wrong. Lah. You're a surgeon, you don't use a scalpel. Oh, help me. You're a cook, you don't know how to use a frying pan. Die. Lah, right? You're a pastor, preacher, you don't know how to use the Bible. Die. Lah. <clears throat> All right? <clears throat> okay? So, I, this is why we put this uh, topic. There. Because a lot of preaching is so shallow, so boring, you know? And... It's not the Bible's fault, okay? We just don't know how to interpret the Bible. All right, discovering meaning. This is what we were talking about in Chronicles just now, right? Christians don't realize how much they've been blessed by earlier generations of Christian teachers. Thankfully, we don't have to start from scratch to discover the meaning of Scripture by ourselves. Thankfully, I don't have to start from scratch to learn the meaning of medicine by myself. Thankfully, I got medical books, that were developed over thousands of years, hundreds and thousands of years. And I'm standing on the shoulders of previous teachers. Okay? Next. Mm. Next slide, yeah. The most underappreciated, underrated method of discovering the meaning of scriptures to learn from other good men. Right? When I was a young, not a full-time preacher, but an aspiring preacher, you know, in my, in my previous church. Um, I read a statement by Spurgeon. Spurgeon said, if you want to preach, you must read through carefully Matthew Henry at least once. Now, in those days, Matthew Henry was six volumes. It cost, cost the world. You, know, you could buy uh, two motorbikes for the price of one Matthew Henry commentary, six volumes. I bought it and I read it from cover to cover. Right? Because good men are the best way to learn. Science, medicine, cooking. You want to be a good cook? Learn from other cooks. 
Everybody does it. Okay? I don't know why, as Christians, we don't. Or many don't. Right? I owe my understanding of the Bible largely to this old guy called Matthew Henry. Those days, commentaries were not common. We didn't have internet. All right? And I bought this sixth one. I literally read it from cover to cover. All right? Seriously. In fact, I read it more than once. Okay. okay. But where did I learn the Bible? You think out of the blue, just ting, 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 like lights, sparks, illumination all the time. As I read, Matthew Henry got illuminated. Mm. All right? Because God uses teachers. Matthew Henry is a teacher I never met, but he's a teacher. All right? He taught me how to understand the meaning of scripture. Mm. Okay? So, let's move on. Mm. So, this is what we talk about just now, right? You know the author, you know the original audience, you know the document, all right? Is it? Okay, move on. Mm. Uh, okay, we talk about this, huh? reading other people's letters. <clears throat> okay. Mm. Now let's take some how we can misinterpret the Bible and go on for years. Okay. Can you all take out your Bible now? Let's look at John 3 16. Mm. Right? Everybody take out John 3 16. Mm. Now, most people preach John 3 16. As for God, so loved the world. Wow, you know, I preach, I preach this for many years like that. I tell you what, huh? God so loved the world that you are a sinner, he also died for you. <clears throat> you reject him, he so loved you, he still died for you. When we say so, it means so much. That's what we meant. All right? And it goes on and on. I keep hearing people preaching that. Then you read John 13, John 3. 14 and 15, even as the Son of Man lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, same word, huh? so shall the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. What's the context? The so means so much? No. For God as even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so, so here means in the same way, thus shall the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Right? So basically, the word so doesn't mean so much. It means just as the Israelites in the wilderness, when they complain about the food that God gave them from heaven, God sends serpents to bite them. That's found in Numbers. And when the serpents bit them, they cried out to Moses and said, Moses, save us. Pray to God. And what did God tell Moses? Make a serpent of brass or bronze. Put it on a pillar, lift it up. And whoever looks on the bronze serpent will not perish but have everlasting life. So, in the same way, verse 16 says, For God so loved the world. In the same way, as Moses lifted up the serpent, God allowed his son to be lifted up. And whosoever looked at him by faith shall not perish. I hope you begin to see. It's a clear parallel between what Moses did and what Jesus did to be lifted up. You see, the people in Israel were bitten by serpents and they had venom or poison in their blood. And that poison would kill them. Today, we are all bitten by a, sin called, by a problem called sin. And sin will kill us. But how did the people in the wilderness get saved? Simple act of faith. Look. Look. Do nothing. Look. That's all. At God's provision. Today, how are we saved? Same way. For God so loved, the same way. He gave a provision that all we need to do is believe. All the Israelites need to do was look. 
You see, so the word so, it does not about so big. But God provided the same way a provision that you just needed to trust. No works involved. They didn't have to kill the serpent. They didn't have to tonicate their leg. They didn't have to put, take medicine against venom. They just needed to trust God's provision for salvation in the wilderness. Today, we just need to trust God's provision. For God so loved the world in the same way that he loved the Israelites, gave them a provision. He gave us a provision. You see, so when we don't understand scripture, we can actually twist this word and say, for God so loved the world. And we don't even read John 3, 14 and 15. I tell you, most evangelists never read John 3, 14 and 15 which is obviously connected to John 3.16, because even as Moses lifted up, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. And then John 3.15 is almost identical to John 3.16. Telling you, it's connected, guys, it's connected. All right? But we can go on preaching and preaching a new version. It's got nothing to do with so much. It's about the same way of providing a very simple solution for salvation. No works needed. No brilliance needed. Just look at the serpent. Look at Christ and say, thank you, Lord. All right? So I hope this helps us to realize, you know, many times we can even in the most simple passage make horrible mistakes. Right, and put words in God's mouth. <laughs> Not meaning to, but doing it. All right, let's move on. What about Matthew 8, 28, 19? <clears throat> go ye therefore and make disciples. Every missions conference, go, go, go into all the world. <clears throat> if you understand even basic Greek grammar, the imperative verb, the command in this is make disciples, not go. <coughs> All right? Anybody who knows, I call it Greek 101, basic Greek, will know there's one imperative verb there. One, make disciples. Going is not the verb. Going is passive. As you are going, make disciples. You go to office, make disciples. <coughs> you go... To be, meet, meet your relatives, make disciples of them. All right? So, again, mission conference after mission conference is preached in a totally way, a way that God said, I didn't say that. <coughs> all right? So, <coughs> be careful, all right? As preachers, we can be quite not preaching wrong in obscure verses. That one I can, I can almost forgive us ourselves. But even in the so-called two key verses of Christianity, John 3, 16, Matthew 28, 19, we can preach completely a different message. Scary, isn't it? All right? So let's move on. Next slide, please. Okay, just uh, skip this. Skip the next one, yeah. All right, so that's lesson six. Huh? Okay, discovering meaning. Use teachers because they help you. If you just read a little bit, you wouldn't be making the John 3.16 mistake and the Matthew 28 mistake, huh? if you just read a little bit. Okay, next. Application is very, very important in uh, preaching. Yeah, next. All right. Uh, so though the... Bible was written to people thousands of years ago, thousands of kilometers away from us, but there are some similarities. Same God, same world, and you know what? Throughout ages, same three classes of people. Throughout the ages, there are three classes of people. People say many different classes. No. Spiritually speaking, three classes. All right? Let's look at the three classes. <clears throat> Every time you preach, you must understand there are these three classes you want to address. Are they there? And if they are, you must do the net falling. Hmm. Unbelievers, category one. Those guys who don't know about God, don't care about God. False believers, those guys who think they know Christ, 
think they're believers, but they're not. And then believers. So just remember this, huh? Every time you preach, you must remember there are three classes of people before you. And depending on which, sorry, uh, same slide, uh, a little please. Mm. <clears throat> depending on which group you want to address, you have to do the following. All right? Take example in my church, Christmas, Easter used to be, because before COVID, of course, a time we invite all unbelievers grandfather, grandmother, neighbor, friend. Christmas, they come, you know, it's kind of like religious time. On that day, <clears throat> you realize you want to preach to the unbelievers because they're not likely to come the rest of the year. So then you focus, you apply your message to that category, right? Telling them, you know, about sin and telling them about their lost condition. That, you know, there's a holy God who hates sin. One day you're going to stand before this God and you better repent and trust Him because there's no way you can stand before this God on that day who saw all your sins. You're a dead man. <clears throat> on the day you stand before God who saw every sin in your heart, your thoughts. All right? So when you are preaching on a day like that, you apply the message to the unbelievers because you know that's the day for them. Don't need even to preach to the believers. They'll come back every other Sunday. Don't worry about it. You've got another 51 weeks to preach to them. <clears throat> okay? False believers, also no need. They're going to come back. You know, their wife will bring the husband there. The children go. They're not believers, but they're churchgoers. <clears throat> They'll come back. Okay, so always know your audience. What are you, what are you targeting? If you don't know your message is, you know, to try to hit three three birds with one one uh, rifle, you probably miss all the three, right? So remember these three categories every time, and ask yourself, where is my primary target, right? And then you know what to do. Okay, next. Yep. So lesson eight. Okay, this one is quite simple. Huh? Um, there are different epochs. You know, God dealt with people differently. For example, at the time of Abraham, God didn't tell him a lot. Just God just wanted to know there's one God. See, up to that time, everybody thought each nation had their own God, each each barangay had their own God. But Abraham knew there was one God. That's all, you know. Abraham didn't know a lot about polygamy, about other stuff. He didn't know about having mercy on the poor, evangelizing. No, no, nothing of that sort. Lah. In his epoch, God was just trying to teach him one simple thing. Not many gods, ah, huh? One God, huh? Okay? So, he's like a little child being taught. Huh? The first simple truth. Okay? First commandment, basically. There's one God. Right. And so God dealt with them and added and added and added more rules as his people became more matured in understanding him. Just like our children, we teach them simple things. As they get bigger, we teach them more things because they're expected to know more. Right? So God's people grew in understanding. So he, he didn't just say, hey, just know there's one God enough. No, no, no. Now we have so many other rules. Right? So he deals with us slightly differently each Epoch or covenant, right? Next slide. <clears throat> okay, just skip this one. <clears throat> but I want you to know that there's one storyline throughout the whole Bible. And many Christians today don't know this storyline. The storyline is very simple. Every story is like that. Any good story has a protagonist, a good guy, and a bad guy. All right? Every story. Any interesting story, his war story, love story, the good guy, the bad guy. The Bible is the same. Protagonist, God. Antagonist, Satan and his allies. Right? The only difference is, in a typical story, the protagonist, antagonist, sometimes equal power. Lah. So, you know, fighting, 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 fighting. Huh? But in our storyline, the Bible storyline, the protagonist is God. 
I cannot say Satan and God's same power are mad. Right? God's all powerful, but God allows Satan to oppose him and his people. Okay? Just get that straight. That's the only difference between other storylines and this storyline. Okay? So where there's a time on Adam, Noah, Abraham, this storyline continues from Genesis chapter 3 right to Revelation, the end. The storyline never changes. There's the enemy trying to get. Now, you say, what PC, why tell us this? We all know this. The truth is we don't. Next slide. You know, ancient Christians, the early Christians, were very aware of the spiritual battle. Totally aware of it. They knew the spiritual battle is very real. Today's Christians are totally unaware of a spiritual battle. I say that without reservation. They think Satan is like already retired, not getting old already. He's an old folks' home already. They just preach hard. As long as I prepare my sermon, they will listen, they will get change. You know, we don't know this a battle going on for our minds. We don't know there's a battle going on in, to our disciples. We don't know. We forgot the storyline. Today, we're so intellectual. You say, Pastor, this is so basic. Yes, it's so basic. But it's so neglected. I say without reservation. You start, I'm not saying you make the devil like he's, he's more powerful than God. You know, that's terrible. Some people are like, wow, the devil's everywhere. They're terrified of the devil, casting out here, casting out there. No, like, he that lives in us is greater than he that lives in the world. I know that. But at the same time, I know he's there to irritate. I know he's there to sabotage. I know he can't, he, he's not that powerful, but he's there. All right? But how many Christians do you think go to church and say, you know, we are in a spiritual battle. Not one in a hundred. Right? But if you look at the Bible, the storyline never changes. Right? From Genesis 3, the line of Seth, the line of Cain, and so on and so on. And going around, the Israelites, the Gentiles, the Christians, the unbelievers, the line just continues. <clears throat> right? But if you forget the storyline, you fight the wrong battles, brother. Remember, we don't fight with flesh and blood. And we all know the verse. But we don't really practice it. All right, move on. Four shadows. Huh? Four shadows is just a type, you know. Isaac's sacrifice in Moriah, the type of Christ's sacrifice. Joseph's life. Perfect life, Joseph, you know, almost a sinless life this guy had, you know. His brothers deny him, he sacrificed for them, he never, you know, took revenge on them. It's a type of Christ, you know. Elisha, type of Christ. Raised the dead, healed the leper, hmm. stuff like that, right? So the Bible has a lot of foreshadows that we can use to preach and make things rich. You know, when you preach about Joseph's story, you should... Say, you know how he foreshadows Christ's life, right? When you preach about Elisha, it's not a character study of Elisha. It's more, of, Elisha was foreshadowing another one coming later, right? He giving you some hints of how Christ would be, all right? So a foreshadowing is like a type, all right? Okay, next, next slide. All right, today we come to a fifth part of our section on the book of Revelation. Last time we talked on the millennial kingdom, but today I want to just add on to the things we talked about. See, last week we talked about the three views of the millennial kingdom, right? That basically, there are actually many sub views, but basically pre mill, a mill, post mill. Huh? Pre mill is people who believe there will be a millennial kingdom, okay? which I personally believe in that. 
Many don't believe there will ever be a millennial kingdom, though they will fall into our mill. I mean, no millennial kingdom. Uh, they believe that the millennial kingdom, the thousand years, just speaks of the church age, the time Christ died, rose again, sent the Holy Spirit until he comes again. Right? So we are in the church age. They call this the millennium. All right? Not a literal thousand years, but a long time. So many believe they are mill. Right? And then some have a post mill. It's almost like we are mill at the end. The only difference is at the end, there'll be a great tribulation for the post mill. But even in these three groups, there are sub, sub, sub groups. All right? And basically, we said in the millennial kingdom, we'd be like a perfect rule of Jesus Christ in his, in his kingdom as he sits on the throne. And we talk about seven beautiful things. Uh, a perfect ruler, perfect peace, perfect uh, health, perfect spiritual knowledge, perfect harmony, and so on, all right? And then even a perfect millennial temple, right? And then at that point last week, we stopped. I didn't go further because it's very confusing. Now, we all have different views of exactly how the millennial kingdom will be, but I try to make it as simple as possible. And I personally like this uh, scale or this report done by somebody called George Zeller. Now, George Zeller is a good man. I don't agree with everything he believes. In fact, we do disagree with a lot of things. But on this part of the millennium, he has really made it very simple for us. If you have this in your mind, what we're going to learn today, honestly, you will not have much problem being confused. Now, you don't have to agree with everything George Zeller says here, but I think he's made it very simple. So for most of us, this would be a beautiful way to remember what the millennial kingdom will be like. All right, so let's just take, this is adapted a little bit from George Zeller's uh, original. I took the liberty to adapt a little bit. I would say 90 over percent is still his work, okay? So let's just look at a quick overview of the Millennial Kingdom so that you will not be confused and hopefully less confused. Maybe that will be a better word, all right? So we see the topics. Uh, he divides this, um, this to help us understand. He divides the world or the ages after Christ's uh, coming and resurrection into this present age. We call it the present world, the one we're living in now. And then... The next stage is called the age to come, according to premillennialists, that will be the millennium or the millennial kingdom. And then the final stage will be the eternal state or eternal ages. Huh? All right, so he divides it into these three. We are at the first one, okay? Duration of the present age, we don't know exactly how old this world is, and we don't know how long more before Christ comes, all right? So, unknown to us, okay? When did the world start? When will, uh, uh, sorry, uh, apologies, not when the world started. When Christ rose from the dead, all right? And he sent the Holy Spirit to us that started the present age, the world we live in now as believers. But when will it end? We don't know, okay? So the millennial kingdom, we know how long it is, 1,000 years, as far as Revelation 20. The eternal state ages, duration, of course, forever and ever, like, zillion, 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 zillion years. Now, what's the event before the present age? The event before the present age is Christ's death, Christ's resurrection, his ascension, and the sending of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost. Pentecost began for us, the present age, okay? What are the event preceding the millennial kingdom? It's very simple, okay? It's preceded by the great tribulation. Okay, so there's going to be a time at the end of this present age of the tribulation. And then the, at this tribulation, okay, shortly after that, Christ would come. Second coming of Christ, right? When the second coming of Christ comes, he begins the millennial kingdom. Okay, so I hope that helps. If you look at it, it will be quite simple. Then what about the eternal ages? What precedes the final stage of, of time is 
that would be the great white throne judgment which we will do in today's lesson okay so today's lesson the second part is the great white throne judgment after that it is eternity already all right eternal ages now what is the termination point okay now what will end our present age termination point second coming of christ when christ comes again this present age that we are in will end okay what is the termination of the millennium okay it is by the at the termination is okay of the millennium is the release of satan from the bottomless pit okay satan had been bound for a thousand years during millennial kingdom he is released that's the end of the uh millennial kingdom huh? all the verses are the biblical verses are there what is the terminal point of the eternal age is no terminal point now is eternal right so no need to ask that that's not a very wise question what about the resurrection in the present age what about the resurrection when are we going to be resurrected future when christ comes all right then i could be resurrected all right you will be resurrected if you're dead right now what about the resurrection when you are in the millennium okay so the millennium is preceded by the first resurrection that means when christ comes there will be a resurrection of believers right hopefully if i'm dead i'll be resurrected and then i will okay enter the millennium in a resurrected body so there's a first resurrection first resurrection only believers who trust that christ will be resurrected what would be all right the resurrection in the millennial kingdom okay it will be preceded by the sec uh, sorry the eternal ages it will be preceded by the second resurrection great white throne judgment second resurrection is 1000 years after the first resurrection the unbelievers will all be resurrected to face the great white throne judgment okay so what about death uh, now in the present age my goodness death is every it's one of a curse of humanity all of us will be uh you know expecting death at some time in the millennial kingdom death is unusual we live a long long time people in the millennial kingdom in the physical body would live a long time death is not that scary not such a big curse on their lives right <clears throat> then in eternity of course there is no more death <laughs> all right now animals okay in the present age animals and men are always one against the other okay men hunt animals for food animals attack men when they are hunted etc in the millennial kingdom there will be peace between animals and men in the eternal ages no mention of animals but i presume they will be very similar to the millennial kingdom where there will be plenty of animals but no mention not mentioned at all but i believe there will be animals because god in the garden of eden created animals right what about the sea presently there's a big ocean right in the millennial kingdom there is okay no more sea because <laughs> the sea is like a sewage plant the sea salt water tends to clean up dirt and pollution and and bacteria and so on which is very very needed in the present world in the millennial kingdom not needed so there is no sea all right okay. uh, and in the eternal state okay, there is also no more sea okay now next slide next slide please yeah now how about sickness in this present age <laughs> sickness is part of life you almost like expect to get sick huh? very very often millennial kingdom no sickness at all okay eternal ages no sickness at all how about evangelism 
In this present age, very needful. It's our job, make disciples by starting by getting them saved and then building them up, all right? Now, in the millennial kingdom, evangelism is not necessary, okay? But people will still need to choose during the millennial kingdom whether they want to be against God or they want to know God, right? Because, you know, in the millennial kingdom, there will also be people who are not born again. You see, we are resurrected as resurrected bodies in the millennial kingdom, but many are normal people who survived the Great Tribulation, Jews who entered the millennial kingdom, who were not born again, all right? So they will see Christianity all around, they will see God all around, all right? There's no need to like evangelize them in that sense, all right? But they still, at the end, these unsaved people in their physical body would have to make a decision, all right? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Of course, in the new heavens and new earth, evangelism is totally not necessary. Now, who will live in this place? Saved and unsaved people, present age? Wow, plenty of saved and unsaved people all mixed up. Even in the church, there are saved people and unsaved people, all right? Now, at, what about in the millennial kingdom? At the beginning of the millennium, all the people would be saved, all right? But there will, at the end of the time, there will be a great, uh, how would I call it? I can hardly see that. A great, it's so tiny, uh, host of unsaved people, all right? People would be born into the millennia, uh, in the millennial kingdom because there'd be natural bodies there, right? They'd be born in the millennial kingdom. And then these people were born during the millennial kingdom, because their parents were physical bodies, they got married. If you're resurrected, of course, you don't. Huh? If you're not, then you will get married. And then you will have kids, and the kids will have to make a decision at that time. So at the end, there'll be more and more unsaved uh, people. All right. So, of course, eternal state, no need to think about all are saved people. Now, this is a difficult part. The kind of bodies we would have right now, okay? Right now, the kind of body, all of us are in our natural bodies, every one of us. I'm a natural body, I'm not resurrected in this earth, I'm just a normal person, body and spirit, or body and soul, right? We're all natural bodies. But in the millennial kingdom, all right, there will be two groups of people. There'll be the resurrected saints in their glorified resurrected body. Presumably, if I'm dead, and Christ comes again, I'll be at that first resurrection and I'll have my glorified body and I'll enter into the millennial kingdom as a resurrected person. But there will be people there who are, all right, entered as natural bodies into the millennial kingdom because during the great tribulation, not everybody died. Plenty of people died. Plenty of Jews were persecuted, but many survived. And those who survived the tribulation would enter into the millennial kingdom in their natural body. So and that in the millennial kingdom is a mixture of resurrected bodies and natural bodies. That's why the millennial kingdom is very difficult to understand. How do resurrected bodies live together with physical bodies. I think Jesus showed that when he was resurrected. He walked among his disciples. He talked to them. He ate with them. They didn't say, Easy. Jesus came. They didn't. Uh, they were not. They were quite comfortable with him. Though they were shocked that he was resurrected, but his whole being did not scare them. He could mix with them for 40 days before he ascended finally, perfectly comfortably. So this mixture of resurrected bodies and physical bodies, natural bodies, will be in the millennial kingdom. Now, this is why many people reject the millennium, I think, because this is a struggle for people, especially the Greek mind. You know, we talk about the Greek mind. In the Greek mind, anything physical is not good. Spiritual is good. But actually, there's nothing wrong with physical. God made the physical body. What's wrong with my physical body? Nothing. It's made by God. 
But people say that's worldly. No, no, worldliness is the love of the system of the world, the ways of the world. Worldliness and being physical are two different things. Other religions think the body is bad. We can never say the body is bad. When God made man, he said it is very good. God made Adam, who had a physical body, and God said he's made in my image. So Jesus in a resurrected body, okay, uh, has a body, <clears throat> okay? And so God loves the body. God recreates us back when we're dead. Body goes into the tomb, the soul or whatever goes into the, into the arms of the Lord. And when we are resurrected, we come together, body and spirit again. So this is the hard part. Millennium Kingdom has a mixture of these two types. The resurrect, people resurrected body will not get married and have kids, right? People in the natural body will get married and have kids and reproduce. And a lot, a lot of them will be reproduced at that time. Okay, now of course in the eternal state, all of us will be in our glorified body, so no, no issue at all. Okay. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we are awaiting Jesus coming. All right. All of us are awaiting Jesus coming. All of us believers, huh? But in the millennial kingdom, we don't have to wait, it's coming. He's sitting on the throne there. All right. They are, but there are still enemies and still death. In other words, though he sits on the throne reigning in the millennial kingdom, yet, all right, there is not like the final state, okay? <clears throat> now, of course, in the eternal state, there are no more enemies, okay? The kingdom, Jesus delivers the kingdom into the hands of God. Now, where will the devil be in this present age? Of course, we know like, he's everywhere. He's on the loose, walking about whom, seeking whom he may devour, right? But in the millennial kingdom, he's bound up for 1,000 years in this temporary prison where he's bound up. And then at the end of the millennial kingdom, he is released, right? In the eternal state, where is he? He's thrown into the lake of fire. Gone forever. Huh? Okay, next slide. Religion. Present day, what kind of religions do we have? All kinds of religions. God allows every kind. Huh? Even within Christianity, there are kind of false Christianity. So present age, very confusing in terms of religion. During the millennial kingdom, no more false religion. Jesus on the throne, he will not tolerate any false religion. <laughs> Excuse me. And then, of course, in the eternal age, only true worship forever and ever. <clears throat> what about war and peace? Present age, war is the most common thing. We expect wars. We are shocked when there's long periods of peace. Okay? We wait for the Prince of Peace to come. During the Millennial Kingdom, the Prince of Peace sits on the throne. No more war. Right? And of course, at the, until the end of the millennial kingdom, where the, uh, Satan is released, he will lead a great rebellion, okay? A final rebellion. Then the final war, after 1,000 years, no war, they finally, at the end of the uh, millennium, uh, Satan leads the unsafe people in the millennial kingdom to make war with Christ, okay? Now, of course, eternal state, no more war. Eternal state is easier to understand than millennial kingdom. Sacrifice, what about animal sacrifices? Today, no animal sacrifices. We just commemorate Christ's death with the Lord's Supper. That's all we do. Commemorating the lamb that was slain in the Old Testament, which pictured Christ. Commemorating Christ, our lamb who died on the cross. We just have the Lord's Supper. But interestingly enough, in the millennial kingdom, there will be animal sacrifices because there will be a millennial temple. And the Jews were made to offer animal sacrifices to remind them how they were so foolish that God had given them animal sacrifices for thousands of years to teach them that one day the Lamb of God would come bloody and broken and despised, slaughtered on the cross, but they didn't see it. So every day in the millennial kingdom, they will bring up 
the Jews would go to the king, uh, to the temple and offer the animal sacrifice as a reminder to them, you stupid fellow, how come you never saw it? It's not a substitute for Christ. Christ's sacrifice is once and for all, but it's like a reminder. It's like the Lord's Supper we do once a week, once a month. They do it as a remembrance of, for us, a remembrance of what Christ did for them. When they go to the Millennial King Temple, is to remind them how foolish they were to reject Christ, all right? Of course, in the eternal stage, there is no more sacrificial system. Today, present age, temple, is there a temple? No need. We are the temple of God. Holy Spirit lives in us. During the millennial kingdom, there will be a very super temple. That's described beautifully in Ezekiel chapter 40 to chapter 48. All right? Amazing. Uh, uh, okay? And then finally, in the eternal stage, no more temple because the glorious and great God is right there with us in the new heaven and new earth. What about the Lord Jesus Christ? What is his status, right? In the present age, he is our Lord. Somewhere up there. In the millennial kingdom, he will be right there as the king of the millennial kingdom. One king only. Huh? Now there are many kings, right? Millennial kingdom, one king. He will be the king there, right? And then in the eternal state he will be on the throne the throne of god the father and throne of the lamb he will be the lamb of eternity okay now this is just three uh, very simple slides that will help us i believe to understand in quite simple terms you may not agree everything that george zeller puts down here there may be some variations in how you believe things are and in fact most people who are so-called pre-millennium, millennial, would also disagree on certain things among themselves. Huh? So that's the reason why most Christians struggle when they reach the book of Revelation. They get stuck at Revelation 20, which describes the millennial kingdom. And then most seminary students would be stuck there debating things trying to grasp the millennial kingdom. And then by the time the semester ends and the course ends, they have no time to really look at Revelation 21 and 22, which is about the new heaven and the new earth. So most people get stuck at the millennial kingdom. So I don't want you all to spend too much time arguing with one another about the millennial kingdom. You have your views? I have my views. I'm not sure who's exactly right, right? But I think George Zeller in this very simple chart has given us quite a simple way. I've read many different books on the Millennial Kingdom. There is more narrative. You really try to picture it in your mind. Not so easy. But if you keep these three little pictures or slides or whatever in your mind as a reference, <laughs> And whenever people ask you about the millennium, you'll probably have a pretty good understanding of it. So I would suggest don't debate on this about the fine points of this. I think the major points that George Teller puts down can be agreed by most pre-millennialists, all right? And I think many of us here are pre-millennialists because it's hard to read Revelation one chapter after another without seeing the millennium stuck between the present age or the present world and the new heaven and new earth. As you read through, you read chapter 19, and then, oh, chapter 20 is the millennial kingdom, and then, oh, after that is a new heaven and new age, very much like this, okay? So if you read Revelation as one book, and I believe the early church, too, historically speaking, were basically pre millennialists, but I'm not going to make a big debate about this. If you're our mill, you're post mill, that's fine. We can still be brothers. We can agree to disagree. Huh? So I hope you don't spend too much time agonizing. It's very hard for you to grasp the millennial kingdom where resurrected bodies, physical bodies come together, you know, Christ's resurrected body on the throne ruling over, and we as 
resurrected bodies, having rule over physical bodies who seem to obey God, seem to obey God, and the last part, they rebel against God. Very hard to grasp all these things. Uh, but I hope that this helps you to put the, the picture in order, but don't get too caught up in Revelation chapter 20, because 21 and 22 is the exciting part. So at this point, we move on to the great white throne judgment, right? Which begins the end of time, the end of the millennial kingdom and enter into the eternal stage. <clears throat> All right, we now come to the great white throne judgment. This is the only place in the Bible you will see the term, the great white throne judgment. Let me explain it to you, okay? All people who not, did not receive Jesus as their savior will be resurrected at the second resurrection, all right? And at this resurrection, they will be judged at the great white throne judgment for their sins. And of course, everybody has sins. Everyone is a sinner who didn't receive Jesus. All his sins has to be paid for, so he's thrown into the eternal lake of fire. At this point of time, only Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet are there. Three lonely fellows there now. They have millions of people joining them, screaming and yelling in the lake of fire. So this is the second resurrection. Okay, next slide. Now, those who trusted Jesus actually were raised 1,000 years earlier at the first resurrection, all right? And they were not judged at the great white throne judgment. They were judged at the judgment seat of Christ. You see that phrase, huh? this one is called great white throne judgment. That one is called a judgment seat of Christ. Judgment seat of Christ is for rewards, not to be condemned, but to decide your rewards for the good works that you have done. Your sins are already settled at the cross, so that's not an issue if you've trusted Jesus. So what's the judgment for? For rewards, not for punishment. Punishment, Christ paid already, all right? And then these people were resurrected a thousand years earlier, right? Will live in their resurrected bodies in the millennial kingdom, right? So let's read some verses to justify the judgment seat of Christ and to see where we got that from. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, not the great white throne judgment. Huh? We are Christians. Huh? First Corinthians, actually, or Second Corinthians, chapter five, verse ten. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So we will appear before the judgment seat of Christ for our reward, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So all the good deeds of yours will be rewarded. All those things you did that are junk will not be rewarded. All right, next slide. Now, actually, I want to explain the term death. You know. In the dictionary, death means the cessation, end of everything. The truth is, okay, death for believers is not the end of everything. The body goes into the grave, yeah, it seems to end, but no, no more function, right? The body is like not, not functioning, huh? but the spirit is still alive. So can you say death is the end of everything for a believer? Answer is no. Okay, what about unbeliever? Again, right? For a believer, death means separation of the body. That's a death, what happens? The separation of your body from your spirit, okay? For unbeliever, what is death? They are separated from God forever and ever, right? To be forever in the lake of fire. So actually, the term death is not nothingness. It's not you stop breathing and stop functioning. No, it means actually the it's not find in the dictionary, but really it means separation of us, our body, and our spirit for a time being. Then later we get resurrected. For the dead person, body, spirit separated, and then finally separated from God also. So death means separation. Huh? That's probably a better definition, not found in the dictionary, but theological. The uh, definition of death is separation. Next slide. Who will sit on the great white throne judgment? It, the Bible tells us in John 5.22, the Father judges no one. He's given all judgment to the Son. John 
for he has given him authority to execute judgment because he's the son of man. All right, so who would be on the great white throne judgment? Jesus Christ. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Now, this is very interesting. People are a bit confused here. I'm going to read the verse, uh, verse 12 of chapter 20 here. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. The books were open. Then another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. So you see, there are two kinds of books here. One is a singular one called the book of life, one only. Then the other one is volumes and volumes called the books, right? Books. And this is where all our deeds are put down, okay? So basically, the book of life. What's the book of life? Singular, huh? One book of life, like registry, huh? It is the uh, names of all who have ever lived. I believe this, huh? right? The names are removed when they die. Okay, so if your name, when you're born, you put there, Paul Chu. Now, assuming Paul Chu never trusted Jesus as Savior, when Paul Chu died, that name's removed from the book of life. He's not alive anymore, all right? But when Paul Chu's dies and he has trusted Jesus as Savior, the name is not removed because he has everlasting life. Okay? So the book of life is one single book registering everybody that ever existed. And it's that fellow is erased from the book if he dies and has not trusted Jesus. Now, the books, on the other hand, are records of all the sins that we have committed. Okay, so for the people who have not trusted Jesus, they will stand before God and the books will be open. All their sins, oh my goodness, I don't know how many volumes these books are, you know, uh, uh, and how God is going to judge it, how long it will take to judge. People have billions of sins, right? But no mention of the time, no mention how fast God can, Jesus can work, but the point is every sin that these fellows have sinned, they will be judged for it. That means, of course, those have sinned hor horrendous sins probably will suffer greater in the lake of fire, presumably. All right, next slide. So two kinds of books, huh? Okay, we come to the good part. Huh? <clears throat> there is an introduction to chapter, actually it should be chapter 21 and 22. I'm afraid it's the wrong uh, thing there. All right, I, my apologies. Okay, this chapter 21 and 20, 22 is about the paradise, the eternal paradise that we will all enjoy, okay? Now, let me give you a kind of overview. There's a yearning in the human heart uh, for life in paradise. I think all of us yearn for it. We dream of how we can go for holiday with our family, with our friends, go up to the parks and see beautiful flowers and pet beautiful animals and see mountains and see valleys and see waterfalls and breathe fresh air. Isn't that what everybody considers a nice thing, all right? In fact, all cultures, when people die, they, they imagine their, their loved ones go to this kind of place, you know, they cross a few bridges, etc., and they go to this amazing place, which is what I just described. So it is as if, as if there was something our human heart uh, that realized this is what we were created to enjoy, this kind of paradise. Eden, Garden of Eden. But the paradise was lost in long ago by Adam and Eve. So, but somehow the memory of it is in every human heart. That's what we want. That's what we hope to be in, right? It's funny, you know, every human heart thinks of that in every culture. Next slide. Okay. Now, the Old Testament prophetic books prophesied repeatedly that the Jews would be regathered one day in Jerusalem under their king. All right, so human heart yearns for this. The Jewish heart yearns because in the, all their prophecies, they yearn that one day all the Jews will be regathered back in Jerusalem. All the Jews who, you know, uh, will be gathered back and will be under their king, a descendant of David. That's the dream of Jews, okay? Next slide. 
<clears throat> now, let's talk about the resurrected body. So that was the introduction. Huh? Now, Jesus was resurrected with the resurrected body. Huh? That the resurrected body of Jesus is the first fruit, right, of our uh, you see that in the lower part of the verse there, 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. First fruit is the first fruit, the first harvest, and then other fruits will follow. So Jesus is the first one to have a resurrected body. One day, I will have a resurrected body, all right? When Christ, uh, when I am raised up, my body raised from the grave, my spirit joins me, okay? But what is a resurrected body like? Okay, Jesus had one, I will have one, but it's described in Luke 24. See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for my spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Touch me, he said. I have flesh. Touch my flesh and I have bones. A spirit doesn't have that, okay? So a resurrected body will have a real body with flesh and bones. And when, verse 40, and when he had said, this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still disbelieved, while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled or grilled fish, and he took it and ate before them. So, what was Jesus trying to tell them? Jesus said, One day you have a real body. A resurrected body like mine. They, they were shocked because they see Jesus died, they see Jesus buried, all right? And the two really dead men gone, all right? But now he's alive. All those wounds on his body, all the whipping and everything is gone, all right? And they touch his body, it was a real body. And you know what? He actually purposely ate a fish before them, okay? To tell them, I have a real body, I'm going to really eat. And one day you too will, because he is the first fruits. Things like, mm. So in the Bible, you will find the word heaven several times, but sometimes the word heaven is not defined which heaven. So just for helping you, there are actually theore uh, theologically three heavens in the Bible, right? The first heaven is where the birds fly, you know? God created the birds to fly in the heavens. Heavens means the atmospheric atmosphere of the earth. The atmosphere means around the earth is a layer of air and oxygen that birds can fly and eagles can soar up there, huh? all right? And men can take a balloon and go high, high, high and still breathe, all right? So that's the atmosphere, first heaven. The second one is where the stars are, all right? We call it outer space, where rockets go up. Now, if you the man in the rocket put his head out, you would die. There's no oxygen there, right? So the second heaven is what you and I would call outer space. The third heaven, which I will read in 2 Corinthians 12 2, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Oh, what do you say? What is the third heaven? The rockets go up to the second heaven space. Then if they go further, 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 is that the third heaven? No, <laughs> that's not the third heaven. The third heaven is technically a space where God dwells. And we can almost say where the spirits dwell. All right, the angels dwell with God. Now, where is this place, geographically speaking? Is it first he heaven, atmosphere, outer space, and then you reach the third heaven? I don't think it is a, like that. I don't think it's a geography that is further than the second heaven. I think it is a place where God dwells, right? Now, let's look at the next slide. That may be described there. Let's see. Okay, the third heaven is what we call a realm, not a location, okay, where God dwells. And this place may be right here with us, but we can't see. We are not able to see. Maybe I put it in simple terms. There's bacteria on us you can't see, viruses you can't see, too small. There's oxygen you can't see because they're not physical, right? So our eyes cannot see oxygen. Our eyes also cannot see there is a spiritual realm around us where God dwells. Angels dwell there. Maybe right now as I'm recording, they're walking around me, but I just can't see, all right? But... Sometimes God allows us to take a peep into that world. 
Okay, sometimes. Like I think Matthew 17 will give you a good one. Huh? And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun. His clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking to them. This is a uh, story, uh, the event of the Mount of Transfiguration, huh? all right, where the apostles went up and they saw, oh, they saw Moses come down, they saw Elijah come down, and Jesus standing there, all right? Moses and Elijah had gone long, long ago already, but it was brought back, they were brought back. And this was a realm that normally nobody can see, but on that day, God allowed them to see, oh, Moses, Elijah, and maybe, you know, once in a while, God allows people to see, oh, angels around us, huh? all right? So it's a realm. It's not a faraway place. It may be right here next to me, where God is right here around me, and I still can't see unless he shows, he reveals himself to me. So basically, third heaven is a place where God dwells, which is actually everywhere. <laughs> All right. So very hard to grasp, huh? All right. But that's the third heaven that you have a peep into the throne of God. You have a peep into the things that happen around God. That's the third heaven. And maybe around here. All right. Uh, okay, next slide. Hard to understand, hard to explain. Yeah. Now, in the new heaven and new earth, this is all introduction. Okay. What will happen is Christ will unite all things and eliminate division between them, between God and men, between men and men, between men and animals. All right, let's look at verse uh, Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time a, to unite all things in him things in heaven and things on earth. So when we say, when we come to the new heaven, new earth, God and men, no big separation right now. Men and men, now we fight one another, we quarrel one another, no more. Men and animals, no more. Animals will run from men and eat men up. They'll be friends, all right? So heaven is basically about unity of everything because of Christ, things like Okay, in the new heaven and new earth, what is the goal? <laughs> Man will continue to fulfill the cultural mandate that was originally given to Adam. Huh? So we see here, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, etc. Okay. Look at Revelation 22. Dominion means rule, to reign. Okay, and night will be no more. They will need the light of the Lamb of, uh, of the Sun and need no light of the Lamb of the Sun, for the Lord will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. Okay, Adam was asked to rule and reign over everything. Of course, at that time there are no other humans, so he reigned over birds and animals. But you and I, what are we going to do? Same thing, rule and reign. Okay, next slide. So, in Revelation 21 and 22, there is very little description of the new earth. Just two chapters. <laughs> the place we're going to live forever and ever. Just two chapters. Big book, you know, hundreds, thousands of chapters. Only two chapters describe the new earth. Why? Because the truth is, we can imagine an improved earth. It's not very complicated. Flowers, I can imagine, waterfall, I just, it's just going to be a lot better. Brighter flowers, bigger flowers, juicier fruits, you know, higher mountains and better waterfalls and beautiful lakes, etc. I can picture them. All right? It's not something I need to explain a lot. So there's not much description. Next slide. So, all right. <clears throat> Though all Christians affirm the belief in the resurrection of the body, most Christians believe they will spend eternity as angel-like, disembodied spirits. That means many people imagine that they will be like angels floating in heaven, right? Forever and ever. Share the possible factors that's led to this misconception. Why is it when the Bible tells us 
will be resurrected like Jesus. It won't be floating around. When Jesus ate, ate fish, he had bones. When bones don't float around, right? Why is it people think that way? Okay, what are the many factors that make us think we will be some, some floaty, angelic being rather than like Jesus when he was resurrected? Walking among them, say, touch my body, touch it, there's flesh and bones. Hey, give me some fish to eat, right? So why is it that we have this wrong concept of our eternal future? Hey, that's very important, you know, you're going to be there forever. You have the wrong idea where you're going to be and what you're going to, what you're going to be and where you're going to be, floating on a cloud or walking on a new earth, all right? So discuss that for maybe 10 minutes, right?